Today, 9th April, we are, I think, starting to see a situation where it is no longer sufficient to talk about Russian actions in Ukraine and the area of the special military operation as active defence, as the Russians still refer to it. It seems to me that overall we can now, I think, confidently speak of a Russian offensive being underway. To be clear, this is not the offensive that we've been hearing so much about, the offensive that might capture Kharkiv, or Zaporozhye, or Dnieper, or Kiev, or break through to Ukraine's western border, or cross the Dnieper, all reports, suggestions that I've seen at various times over the last few weeks. That offensive, of course, supposedly due to begin in August, or in June, or in May. Kirill Budanov, by the way, has just made comments. He says that the Russian offensive, the really big, the real Russian offensive, will happen in late May or early June. By the way, that would be almost exactly a year since the start of Ukraine's own disastrous offensive of the summer of 2023. Anyway, we are not seeing at the moment an offensive like that. We're not seeing from the Russians that kind of an offensive. But it is clear that the Russians are now moving beyond active defence. They're clearly capturing places. Their advance is gaining an ever greater momentum and tempo. And I think this is becoming increasingly clear from the increasingly aggressive way in which the Russians are conducting operations right across Ukraine. To be clear, aggressive attrition still applies. That still, I think, is the governing philosophy of Russian operations, uh, grinding down the Ukrainian army. But of course, that's it's not just attrition, it's aggressive attrition, which also encompasses the capture of Ukraine's major fortified positions, places like Avdeevka, Chasov Yar, Pervomaisky, Novomikhailovka, Siversk. We'll come to all of these places soon. Anyway, there is an aggressive quality to the attrition. The point is that though the attrition continues, at all times, and in the same way, currently it is starting to become even more aggressive as, as, as the tempo, the movement, the forward movement of the Russian military along the front lines um, starts to gain further pace. Now, in saying all of this, just a number of observations still to make. We are still in the period of the spring thaw, the Rasputitsa, or at least so I understand, the ground is still soft. That must affect military operations, at least to some degree. It presumably explains why, when we see films of Russian armoured movements, they tend to be confined to the roads, though the Russian tanks and armoured vehicles also can operate to some extent on soft ground through the fields. Again, Jim Kinnear's books are the ones to go to to read and understand all of that. But anyway, it is still the time of the spring Rasputitsa. Probably by now, the ground is starting to harden, at least to some extent. I'm guessing that the temperatures are starting to rise, but it's not going to be the case that the ground will harden fully until presumably the second half of May. The spring Rasputitsa always seems to be longer than that of the winter, the autumn, 
So anyway, we've probably got at least some more weeks to see before things start to intensify and accelerate even more. But anyway, let's actually discuss what is really happening on the battlefronts. Now, this morning we got news that Pervomaisky has actually fallen. And there is a report to this effect. This morning on uh, Radovka, which um, um, tells us that, um, according to military correspondence, Redo um, Pervomaisky has been captured. This is a report from Redovka. Redovka, to repeat again, is a Russian newspaper. It is published in Smolensk, Russian town Smolensk, in Western Russia. It is very much on the patriotic side of the Russian spectrum, but it actually covers a lot of news, and it's far from being a simple tabloid or anything like that. Its commentaries are factual. Its discussions of military developments have become actually rather more interesting and more analytical recently. But anyway, this is what Radovka says about the current situation in Pervomaisky. It says that uh, the Russian armed forces took control of Pervomaisky, lo located near Avdevka, defeating two brigades of the Ukrainian armed forces. War correspondents Andrei Rudenko and Semyon Pogov Pegov, rather, shared the relevant information. According to them, soldiers of the 9th Separate Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade of the 1st Army Corps of the Russian Armed Forces took part in the liberation of the of town. Military correspondents noted that there were fierce battles for this town between the Russian and Ukrainian sides. Um, Pegov said the Ukrainian military retreated beyond the western borders of the town, but small groups of them may still remain on the territory of Pervomaisky. According to Pegov, Ukrainian soldiers continue to fire in order to make it difficult to clear the town. So there are, according to um, Redovka, and this is based on this claim from Russian war correspondents, still Ukrainian holdouts within Pervomaisky. It's not a village, it's a small town, 28,000 people. It's quite a large place relative to the other places we've been hearing so much about. Mostly the fight recently has been about villages, but Pervomaisky is, as I said, a small town, 28,000 people before the war. Much of it has been occupied and controlled by the Russians for some time. If there are Ukrainian holdouts, as uh, Pegov, Semyon Pegov says, then they are probably concentrated in the western part of the town. And one way or the other, the Russians will clear and gain control of this town shortly. Anyway, that was the report this morning from Redovka. Now, there's been a slightly more cautious report, which I found on Slavyangrad. This is a, a, a telegram channel. It's not, by the way, exclusively Russian, um, but it is. it tends to take a very strong uh, pro-Russian view of the war. I've discussed Slavyangrad many times. To repeat again, I find it perhaps the single most accurate and interesting uh, channel discussing the war, um, at least in writing, um, and it provides carefully vetted factual reports of what is going on on the battlefronts. It acts as a very competent site aggregator, so if you want to know in English what various um, war reporters War Gonzo, Ribar, the two majors, others like that, are saying, then Slavyangrad is a good place to go for that. But beyond their reporting and their um, work as a site aggregator, they are also very 
competent analysts in their own right, uh, principally, by the way, on the rather cautious side. Um, they're rather careful before they jump in and assume that the reports that um, the optimistic reports from a Russian point of view that are being received are necessarily true. Anyway, this is the report I see today in Slavyangrad. I'm not sure whether it's one of their own, but it could be. Anyway, they said that the Russian army has practically knocked the Ukrainian army out of Pervomaisky. It is reported that the 9th Brigade of the 1st Army Corps has managed to liberate almost the entire settlement. Statements about its complete liberation, however, are premature. The last houses on the outskirts are being cleared. Now, that is not actually entirely contradictory to what Pegov is saying. He concedes that there are still Ukrainian troops holding out in a few houses and buildings in Pervomaisky. So, which is essentially what Slavyangrad is also saying. So the battle for Pervomaisky is not fully over. There's still clearing to do. And of course, there's always a chance that the Ukrainians will counterattack, as they've done in other places, Nova Mikhailovka recently, for example. So it, it could be that there's still a couple more days or perhaps a week of fighting for Pervomaisky still to go. But anyway, the consensus is that essentially, to all intents and purposes, the town has been captured by the Russians. The Russians are certain to consolidate control of it. And I have discussed in recent programs, many recent programs, how the fall of Pervomaisky along with the control of um, Nevolskoy to the south of Pervomaisky. There were claims about a week ago that the Ukrainians had recaptured Nevolskoy, but that doesn't seem to be correct. Anyway, control of these two places, Pervomaisky and Nevolskoy, um, almost certainly means the imminent fall of another small Ukrainian town, Krasnogorovka. And over the last 24 hours, there's been a cascade of news um, about what's going on in Krasnogorovka, with some very detailed discussions of this, the fighting there, from Dima at the Military Summary Channel. Now, just to reiterate briefly, there have been many claims over the last couple of days, including, by the way, on the part of Dima at the Military Summary Channel, that the Ukrainians had pushed the Russians out of the small part of Krasnogorovka, the southern part of Ros Krasnogorovka, which by universal agreement the Russians um, captured back, I think, in February. I've always been sceptical about these claims. Um, there were other claims a little later that the Russians had in fact regained control of part of Krasnogorovka. Uh, others, including Dima, said that the Russians had definitely been pushed out of Krasnogorovka. Um, yesterday and today, we got reports which clearly confirm that there is fighting going on between the Russians and the Ukrainians within Krasnogorovka itself, and it seems to be confirmed that the Russians do still control at least part of Krasnogorovka in the southeast of the town. Now, of course, you can take different views here. You know, again, I want to stress I'm not reporting the situation from the ground. I'm entirely dependent on the reports of others. Um, I look at the various reports. I ask myself which is the more plausible, given the general trend of events. Sometimes it's possible to develop a fairly informed picture. 
but I'm not going to pretend that I know exactly what is happening in any one place at any one time. But I think that the balance of the evidence clearly suggests that the Russians were never pushed out of Krasnogorovka and that those claims that which were made and which were circulating were probably wrong. Anyway, put that aside, um, the fighting within Krasnogorovka does seem to have intensified. And we're now getting lots of reports that the Russians um, sent more troops into Krasnogorovka over the course of the last 24 hours. There's lots of pictures of Russian armoured columns advancing towards Krasnogorovka, entering Krasnogorovka, uh, Russian infantry dismounting from the Russian armoured vehicles, intense fighting going on in the southeast of Krasnogorovka as the Russians enlarge their control. And all of this with intense bombing and shelling of Krasnogorovka by the Russian army. And I think that what has probably happened is that the area of Russian control within Krasnogorovka was probably always rather smaller and less complete than some reports claimed that the Ukrainians still had a presence probably in the southwestern part of Krasnogorovka and perhaps always did. The Russians, however, did retain a foothold. They're now intent on enlarging that foothold. And probably the reason for the sudden increase in the tempo of Russian military operations in Krasnogorovka is precisely information that's coming through that Pervomaisky is about to fall or perhaps has already done so. Maybe by the time this program appears, um, Pegov's predictions will have become true and the Russians will have completely cleared Pervomaisky and it will be fully under Russian control. So with Krasnogorovka under attack, with Pervomaisky about to fall, um, with the battle for Krasnogorovka looking increasingly uh, difficult for the Ukrainians, one can start to see why the situation in this part of Donbass is becoming increasingly critical for the Ukrainians. And on top of things, in the area west of Avdevka, which, to be clear, partly includes Pervomaisky. Pervomaisky is the hinge which brings together the fighting in Avdevka, west of Avdevka, and the fighting west of Marinka, towards Kurakovo. Anyway, we're getting lots of further reports that the Russians are not only likely about to push south from Pervomaisky, cutting off the Ukrainian supply lines to Krasnogorovka, uh, bringing about the collapse of the Ukrainian defences in that town, but that the Russians are also continuing to push west, and that they're now approaching Natalovo, which is uh, a village, large village to the west of Pervomaisky, located on this um, water um, water line, places where there is a, apparently a water reservoir and a small river. But anyway, the, the Russians look like they're attacking, um, or close to attacking, Natalova. Some are suggesting that Natalova is going to be the next major focus of the fighting over the next couple of days and uh, weeks maybe as the Russians work to break through and push further westwards perhaps towards Pakrovsk and of course north of Natalovo in the area where the Russians advanced um, west of Toninka and Orlovka over the previous week we're getting more reports of the Russians now um, 
working towards an assault on the small town of Omanska as well, where they destroyed the river, the, the bridge across the river that flows through this town, interrupting communications for the Ukrainians from one part of that town to the other part. So lots of fighting going, got going on there. But extraordinarily, and this perhaps gives us some sense of, firstly, how complicated the battle in Donbass is, and secondly, how the Russians are extremely skilled at attacking in unexpected directions, and also how Russian advances may be taking place without people necessarily being aware of the fact, because the Russian Defense Ministry has shown repeatedly its skill in keeping reporting of particular operations under extremely tight information control. Anyway, remarkably, it seems that the biggest, the most dramatic news has not been happening in these places that we've been hearing so much about, the areas to the west of Toninka and Orlovka, towards Natalovo and uh, Umansky, even in the fighting in Pervomaisky to the southwest of Avdevka. It seems the major Russian advance over the last few days happened pretty much unnoticed. The Russians suddenly occupied a large area of fields and a dacha community, apparently, south of the town of Keramik, to the north of the other Krasnogorovka. This is a small village to the northeast of um, Avdevka, uh, which the Russians captured in March of last year. Anyway, the Russians have been advancing north from there towards the town of Keramik. They seem to have captured large block of territory. Um, Dima has discussed these battles at length. He's somewhat astonished that these advances have happened without anybody up to now really noticing the fact that uh, there's been big Russian advances. It looks as if the Russians are working towards outflanking the Ukrainians in places like Keramik and Ocheretino, uh, to the west, which is, of course, this place on the hill, on the railway line. And it also, by the way, calls into question this Russian advance, um, calls into question these desperate Ukrainian attempts to cling on to the villages of Semenyovka, um, to the west of, uh, northwest of Avdevka, Semenyovka, tense battles going on inside that village for some time. It's located between Orlovka and Merdici. Anyway, fighting going on in this village. The Ukrainians still trying to cling on to part of this village. Um, some reports suggest that the Russians now control the greater part of this village. The Ukrainians also either pushed out of Berdichi further north, but still launching counterattacks against Russian positions there, or perhaps clinging on to some buildings on the western outskirts of Berdichi, the Russians attacking them there too. Um, Radovka about a week ago published a discussion saying how precarious the situation of the Ukrainian troops in Berdichi and Semenyonka have become and that retreat from these two villages now would be extremely dangerous if the Ukrainians ordered it because of the extent to which the Russians would in that case be in a position to shell and bomb the Ukra U retreating Ukrainian troops along the dirt roads to the northwest, just saying. But anyway, with the Russians launching big advances, apparently uh, northeast of these 
places. It, it does make the fighting in Berdici and Semyonovka look suddenly like a sideshow where the Ukrainians have perhaps once again seriously overcommitted. Anyway, it's clear that big things are now happening in the Avdevka area. Um, as I said, Pervomaisky likely to fall, or perhaps already fallen. Um, the situation further south in Krasnogorovka becoming increasingly difficult for the Ukrainians, with Krasnogorovka probably likely to fall also at some point within the next, well, weeks, month. I'm not really good at guessing at timelines, not being an expert in these matters. Um, the Russians, close to breaking through the river barrier, the fortifications on this river barrier, which the Ukrainians desperately tried to cobble together after the fall of Avdevka. Apparently, no fortified lines of any kind beyond this river barrier uh, route opens up, if the Russians choose to take it, all the way to Pakrovsk, town of about 50,000 people to the northwest. Just saying. Um, Dima at the military summary channel um, has suggested that if the Russians complete this operation to the south, to the north of the other Krasnogorovka, the one that I've just been talking about, um, are able to ultimately capture Ocheretino and um, Keramik and all of those places, um, collapsing, in other words, Ukrainian defences to the northwest of Avdevka, then an alternative project for the Russians instead of marching on towards Pakrovsk, might be to do something which I remember Alex Vashinin floated a possibility, the Russian Alex Vashinin floated in an article he wrote for the Royal United Services Institute in the autumn of 2022, which is launch an advance towards the northeast, towards towns like Pavlograd, and ultimately work towards the encirclement of another part of the fortified Ukrainian lines around towns like Toretsk and a place bizarrely named New York. It is actually called that. That is its actual name. It's a large fortified village or small town. Um, the Russians have never attacked these places at any time since the special military operation began. They lie between Avdevka and the Avdevka theater and the Bakhmut theater. The Russians take Ocheretino. They have the option to start a big encirclement strategy surrounding the Ukrainian troops in this fortified area, the Ukrainians would face the difficult choice of either retreating, abandoning a significant amount of ground, important fortified villages, um, and allowing the Russians to link up their forces, their advanced forces from Avdevka with those currently fighting in the Bakhmut area. We'll come to the Bakhmut area shortly. Or, of course, if the Ukrainians decide to do that, which they always do, which is stand and fight and try to defend these places, Toretsk and New York. And Toretsk in particular is apparently an important town and one that the Ukrainians might be very reluctant to retreat from. But anyway, if the Ukrainians choose to stand and fight there, then, for the first time, properly speaking, since the special military operation began, began if the Russians take Chasov Yar and the Russians complete this operation for Keramik and Ocheretino and start advancing 
from those two places to the north east then we might actually see a strategic cauldron emerge uh, a real strategic encirclement like the ones we all know about from the second world war a genuine kettle to give the original german ex expression one in which thousands of ukrainian troops are trapped and encircled um, with the Russians forming a ring around them. And, um, well, obviously that would be a catastrophe for the Ukrainians. So it's not, I don't say it's going to happen, it's not a prediction. But, you know, it's a possibility that is now starting to loom over the horizon. Anyway, big events, therefore. Um, in the Avdevka area, in the Marika area as well. As I said, these two sectors are now clearly linked with each other. Intense fighting for Pervomaisky, place likely to fall. Intense fighting for Krasnogorovka. Um, that battle still has some way to go, but the direction of travel is clear. Sooner or later, Krasnogorovka will fall to the Russians as well. And dramatic news in the Avdevka area with the Russians clearly, it seems to me, now working towards the capture of Ocheretino and Keramik. Apparently there's been Ukrainian counterattacks. Nobody knows how successful or not they have been. And importantly, just as the Kiev Independent mentioned yesterday, I think this report, by the way, from the Kiev Independent that I discussed yesterday um, in my program about the Russians having made big advances in the Avdevka area, clearly was inspired by this advance um, towards Keramik and, Ocer uh, and to the west of, to the east of Ocheretino. Anyway, um, as the Kiev Independent said, the Russian Air Force incredibly active in this area. Apparently, lots of bombing of Ukrainian positions and allegedly ground attack aircraft also being used, um, presumably Sukhoi 25s. Um, so we're not just talking about um, precision guided fab bombs being launched from long distances by Suhoi 34 uh, fighter bombers, um, but actual operation of ground attack aircraft able to support ground operations, ground advances in real time, not just attacking static fortified positions. So very dramatic events on the battlefields around Avdevka. And, well, apparently quite important news from the Bakhmut area as well, perhaps equally important news. Again, it's important to stress once more how tightly the Russian Defense Ministry controls the information. But yesterday, lots of claims, as I discussed uh, in my program, that Bogdanovka, the village to the northeast of Chasov Yar, has now entirely fallen um, to the Russians. Lots of reports that the Russians are attacking the hill and the village to the neck to the west of Bogdanovka. Uh, lots of reports of intense fighting within the micro district. Lots of further reports that the Russians are pushing from Ivanivska uh, westwards um, at, towards the canal and are preparing to outflank um, Chasov Yar, or at least the micro-district of Chasov Yar, west, east of the canal, from the south, and also reports that the Russians continue to advance in the northern part of the micro-district, working towards cutting off fully the supply roads towards the micro-district, with fighting going on 
inside Joseph Yard all the time. We've had few reports from this area, from Joseph, from the, the area of the micro district over the last 24 hours. That doesn't, as I've said previously, mean that the fighting here has not been very intense and that events aren't developing fast. I'm not saying that the second is necessarily true, by the way, but it might be. And rather, as happened in Avdevka, and as is possibly happening um, in Pervomaisky and other places, we could see the collapse in the micro district happen very fast. And it's been suggested that it's been suggested by various, um, it must be said, pro Russian reporters that the situation for the Ukrainians around Chasovia is even more critical than some reports have been saying. The focus, of course, remains very much on the fighting for the micro district. But apparently, the Russians have been intensively bombing and using drone strikes on the supply roads to the main part of Chasofya, west of the canal. They're already able to uh, complicate the supply of the Ukrainian troops in Chasofya itself. And by the way, their potential retreat, if that ever comes, and reinforcement as well. Um, but it seems that these advances by the Russians in Bogdanovka potentially, and there are many claims about this, further Russian advances on the hill to the northwest of Bogdanovka. Again, this isn't fully confirmed, but it's far from impossible. Anyway, um, if all of this is true, it puts the Russians in a position where they can apparently cross the canal and cut off the supply roads, physically cut off the supply roads to Chasofya without much difficulty. I remember many, about a year ago, uh, reading reports, I think it was in the British media, by two Ukrainian soldiers, these were two separate reports, both of these Ukrainian soldiers saying that Chasofya was all but undefendable. It might be on a hill, it might be um, fortified and all of that, but they seem to think that it would not be possible to defend Chasofya for very long, and that that was why it was particularly important to hold on to Bakhmut. This is, of course, these interviews were given during the battle for Bakhmut itself. Um, it may be that those claims made by those Ukrainian soldiers are right, and that the collapse of Joseph Yar might happen faster than many of us think, just as the collapse of Avdevka also happened much faster than most people expected, certainly than I expected. Anyway, there's also further reports now that the Russians are dropping leaflets on Ukrainian troops in the Klesheevka, Andreevka area. These troops all but cut off. Russians, the Russians are apparently calling on these troops to lay down their arms and surrender in order to save themselves. One wonders how receptive the Ukrainian troops are to these calls. But of course, if the Russians are making them at all, it suggests that the situation for these troops has become incredibly difficult. And given the Russian capture of Ivanivska and the Russian advances to the west of Ivanivska, one could see that these troops, that the Ukrainians unwisely kept in and close to Kleshevka and Andreevka, must by now be almost cut off. Anyway, one can understand why the Russians, perhaps at this point, think it's worthwhile making these um, 
calls, these surrender calls. We'll see what happens and whether there is a collapse of Ukrainian resistance in this area. My impression, again, is that General Sirsky, as he always does, has committed some of his best troops to the defence of both in Avdevka and in the Bakhmut area. These are probably some of the toughest, most motivated troops that Ukraine has. Perhaps that makes them less likely to surrender uh, and more likely to go down fighting, which of course will slow the Russians down. But of course it means that Ukraine is going to lose more and more of its few remaining best troops in these battles. So, very bad situation for the Ukrainians in Bakhmut, even if uh, in the Bakhmut, Chasovya area, even if we're getting less information about that over the course of the last 24 hours than we have had about the very dramatic events in the Avdevka area. And elsewhere on the battle lines, the things also for the Ukrainians are looking very bad. Now, there's been an awful lot of discussion, lots of claims about um, the fighting around Belogorovka, this village in Lugansk region, northern Lugansk region, just about the, la the last part of Lugansk region, still under Ukrainian control, once captured by the Russians after the fall of Lysychansk um, back in um, June, um, I think it was June, July um, um, 2022, recaptured by the Ukrainians at the conclusion of the Kharkiv counteroffensive in the autumn of 2022, fortified by the Ukrainians since then. There's been lots of discussion by all sorts of people, Riba, Dima, all sorts of people about how difficult, allegedly, it was, it has been, for the Russians to recapture Belogorovka, that the Russians made a massive mistake in not defending Belogorovka uh, more strongly in the autumn of 2022, that the Ukrainians have successfully fortified their positions along a chalk, in a chalk quarry or landfill um, to the east of Belogorovka, and that has made it all but impossible, supposedly, for the Russians to capture Belogorovka, that repeated Russian attempts to capture the quarry, and or landfill, as it's sometimes called, and Belogorovka itself, um, since the start of the year, have been unsuccessful and successfully repelled by the Ukrainians. My own view, and I've expressed it several times, is that these Russian attacks on the quarry, on Belogorovka itself, were not major attempts to capture Belogorovka. They were intended, again, to keep the Ukrainian troops in Belogorovka busy, to wear them down. Apparently, it was an elite paratroop unit that was defending Belogorovka, elite... Ukrainian paratroop unit, or at least nominally a paratroop unit. Um, Ukrainian paratroopers aren't conducting any airdrops now. There isn't an air transport component left in the Ukrainian Air Force capable of providing them with that kind of airlift capability. But anyway, no doubt, tough, motivated infantry, elite infantry. The Russians have been attacking them, probing at them, keeping them busy, wearing them down, tiring them out um, in these hit-and-run attacks <laughs> that have been taking place um, since the start of the year. But as I said some time ago, it looked to me as if the real Russian attempt to carry to capture Belogorovka only began at the start of this month, in other words, about a week ago. And if the reports are true, and again, one has to be careful because there's always confusion, 
and fog of war. But if the reports are true, the Russians have now, well, they haven't fully encircled the quarry, which is a large place, as quarries go, but they have advanced round it. They've cut off some of the supply roads. They look likely to capture others. And apparently there's a film, which I haven't seen, of Russian troops now um, on the quarry itself, in the chalk quarry, advancing up the chalk quarry. And there's even some claims that the entire area, this entire um, structure, has now fallen and that the Russians have captured it. Which, if true, by the way, would mean that Belogorovka itself is also about to fall. There is a lot of fog of war, a lot of uncertainty as to what precisely is going on around Belogorovka. If it is indeed the case that Belogorovka um, is about to fall, then this is a, an, an event of some consequence. It's a relatively small place, but it is on the way to Siversk. <laughs> um, it's the last part of Lugansk region still controlled by Ukraine. It's unlikely now that the Ukrainians will ever be able to recapture it, all but inconceivable, in fact. And it would open the way for the capture of Siversk, which I suspect is the real Russian priority in this part of Donbass, more so than Liman or Kupiansk further north. I suspect that the major attacks there will happen once Siversk is captured. The Russians, unable to capture Siversk in the summer of 2022, probably intent on capturing it this time. It's been a bone in their throat ever since. If Siversk falls, well, the entire situation, the military geography of northern Donbass decisively changes, and the Russians can mop up places like Liman, Terni, where, by the way, they've also destroyed another bridge across the Zherebets River. Uh, this is the place where the Ukrainians supposedly, or perhaps did, I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't, destroy um, a Russian armoured force some days ago. But anyway, the Russians have just destroyed another bridge across the Zherebets River, working perhaps to cut off Ukrainian troops east of the Zherebets River, who knows. But anyway, um, I think that the major Russian advance, the major Russian push in these places will probably happen once Siversk falls. It was the failure to take Siversk that ultimately un allowed the Ukrainians to unravel the Russian defences in Kharkov region and northern Donbass in the autumn of 2022. So, quite likely, the Battle of Siversk coming, though I think that the main blow there is likely to come only after the fall of Chasifia further south. And last but not least in this brief summary of the events on the battlefronts, lots of reports now um, that the Russians have gained even more ground around Novopikhailovka. Incomprehensible that the Ukrainians are still clinging on to some buildings in the west of Novomikhailovka. A little logic to this. Um, suggestions that the Russians um, are waiting to complete their operations around Vuglada. Apparently they're gaining more ground around Vuglada. Dima has been saying this for some time. And it's only once they've done that that they will finally mop up what's left of the Ukrainian defences in Novomikhailovka and go on to capture places like Paraskovyevka, small village to the west, immediately to the west of Novomikhailovka, apparently being heavily shelled and bombed by the Russians now, and perhaps push on towards Konstantinovka, another Konstantinovka to the west of Paraskovyevka. 
and also push on further west from Georgievka, a village to the north of these places, which the Russians are also said to largely, though not entirely, control now. So anyway, a, a developing situation around in the southern Donbass, just as a developing situation in the northern Donbass around Siversk. But to reiterate again, the main fighting is taking place from Marinka northward through Krasnogorovka, Pervomaisky, in places like Natalovo, Umanska, Berdichi, if the Ukrainians are still fighting there, and now towards Ocheretino, and then further north around Chasovia. It is in central Donbass that the major battle is happening. Now, all of this, along with crippling attacks by the Russians on the Ukrainian positions, and, well, we've had lots of more reports the Russian Defense Ministry yesterday published a further update. And again, the thing that stood out for me once again was the enormous amount of artillery that the Russians are now destroying, Ukrainian artillery that are, the Russians are now destroying. So in the Kupiansk area, which, by the way, um, includes Terny, the area around Terny, the Russians yesterday claimed that they destroyed one 152mm Akatsia self-propelled gun, one 152mm Star B self-propelled gun, that's a relatively advanced artillery system, legacy Soviet system that the Ukrainians have, three 152mm D20 howitzers, and importantly, one more US-made AN TPQ-50 counter-battery radar. The Ukrainians have previously spoken about the fact that they have a big advantage in counter-battery radars. It seems that is no longer the case. The Russians, according to Simplicius the Thinker, began the special military operation with just 10 Zupark counter-battery ra radars, which seems incredible. They now have many, many, many more. Um, and we see the effect. They are now engaging the Ukrainians in a lot more counter-battery work, and they're becoming more successful. So that was in the Kupiansk area, but they've also been busy around in the Bakhmut area as well. They claim that they destroyed their one M777 howitzer, one Polish crab self-propelled artillery system, one Akatsia 152 millimeter um, Akatsia self-propelled system, one 122 millimeter Gvostika self-propelled artillery system, and here they destroyed two American AN TPQ 36 counter-battery radars. Um, and further, south still in the Avdevka area, they destroyed another, according to their claims, another US M777 howitzer um, and another 122mm Gvostika vehicle. And then in the Vremivka salient area, they also claim to have destroyed one um, M109 Paladin self-propelled artillery system supplied by the United States, along with one 155mm FN70 howitzer supplied by Britain. And then further south still, in the um, Zaporozhye area, they claim to have destroyed yet another um, M, uh, 155mm Paladin self-propelled artillery system, two 155mm M119 howitzers, as well as one 122mm D30 howitzers. 
So the Russians engaging in very, very relentless counter-battery artillery work, systematically taking apart Ukraine's relatively limited um, artillery park, and that, of course, slowly eroding Ukraine's ability to um, support military operations. And, of course, also lots of further reports of Russian missile and drone strikes across Ukraine. And more claims, by the way, uh, not so far as I can see confirmed by the Russian Defense Ministry, but more claims that another S-300 um, air defense system has been destroyed over the last 24 hours by the Russian missile forces. And lots of reports of continued Russian attacks on Ukrainian warehouses, logistical centers, all kinds of places. Now, again, this is not actually covered by the Russian Defense Ministry in its latest report. But it seems that, again, the situation in Kharkov is becoming desperate. The city, again, appears to be effectively without electric power. The Russians have apparently destroyed yet another, the last power-generating facility near Kharkov. The governor, the Ukrainian governor of Kharkov region, is now calling for mass evacuation of civilians from large areas of Kharkov region. And the Russians also launching similar intense strikes on the city of Zaporozhye on the east bank of the Dnieper um, in Zaporozhye region. Zaporozhye, by the way, major industrial center, almost entirely a Soviet creation, created by the Soviet Union, as an industrial center on the Dnieper River. Anyway, the Russians have been heavily striking at Zaporozhye, and again, apparently, reports that this city, very important city, likely eventual target of the Russians, is, once, is also now without electric power. And across the Dnieper, on the west bank of the Dnieper, not very far from Zaporozhye, similar huge Russian missile attack on Krivoy Rog, um, Zelensky's hometown. Again, apparently, no air defences operating, either in Zaporozhye or Kharkov or Krivoy Rog. Russians able to attack these places, and some claims that Krivoy Rog, a major industrial centre, a, uh, a centre, by the way, of Ukraine's iron and steel industry, um, that that too now is effectively without electric power. So we can see that the Russians pushing very hard in many different places now. The Ukrainians clinging on, um, but finding it more and more difficult to do. Reports, I think I mentioned them a few days ago, that the Ukrainians have been forced to convert some of the new brigades that they were creating from mechanized brigades to infantry brigades, which some are taking, probably rightly, as a sign that the Ukrainians are running out of armored vehicles. It's an interesting thought. And also, um, lots of reports um, that the Ukrainian ammunition crisis continues to remain unresolved and clear signs that in terms of air defense, the Ukrainian air defense system has to all intents and purposes collapsed so that there is now intense activity by the Russian Air Force all across the front lines. There has been a very long article in the Financial Times discussing the use by the Russian Air Force of their fab glide bombs and the devastating effect these have. Um, there is a rather 
vivid description of how any single building that is struck by one of these bombs will in effect be pulverized. That the effect on morale, Ukrainian troop morale, of these glide bombs is devastating. And that Ukraine has no counter to these weapons. That the um, air defense system has all but collapsed and that Ukrainian air defense missiles are anyway don't have the range to attack Russian aircraft operating with these glide bombs, except perhaps the Patriot system, which, as we know, has been largely destroyed. Ukraine's stock of these systems there, um, most of the batteries that they were supplied have been destroyed by the Russian Air Force. Um, anyway, um, hopes still clinging to the ability of Ukrainian fighter jets, the F-16s, when they appear to counter the Russian aircraft that launch these glide bombs. Uh, I think that virtually everyone who has looked at the situation objectively acknowledges that that is almost certainly a, f a false hope, that the F-16s, when they do appear, will be comprehensively outmatched by the Russian Air Force, that the most likely outcome of the arrival of the F-16s is that most of them fairly quickly will be shot down if the condition of the Ukrainian airfields allows for them to be operated at all. So, a very bad situation altogether across the front lines. So, what is the West doing? Well, I discussed yesterday, and we talked yesterday on the Duran, um, Alex Cristoforo and me, about the latest plan that st seems to exist on the part of Emmanuel Macron and the British at some point to send troops to Ukraine. Edward Lutvak, the great military theorist in the West, I'm being slightly ironic, <laughs> um, is saying that unless the West sends ground troops to Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is lost, and that would mean the return of Russian military power to Central Europe with all the enormous geopolitical consequences that that would have. I've already said that, in my opinion, deploying U uh, European troops, NATO troops, to Ukraine would be an absolute disaster. Um, the Russians would certainly be in a position to defeat them and would defeat them probably quite fast. That the political effect within Europe of that happening would be catastrophic for the future of NATO. And the whole enterprise looks like a cunning plan by Emmanuel Macron to drag the United States into a war which most Americans do not want to be drawn into and where the risks of the United States getting into a direct confrontation with Russia, a nuclear superpower, well, are unimaginably great. Well, part of that plan is currently um, being activated in the sense that David Cameron, I can't bring myself to call him Lord Cameron, by the way, David Cameron, former British Prime Minister, now British Foreign Secretary, he is busy travelling to the United States, He's had a meeting with Donald Trump in Mar-a-Lago, where he's apparently tried to persuade Donald Trump to relax his opposition to further 
US military support for Ukraine. Apparently, David Cameron is also trying to speak to Speaker Johnson and to the Republicans in Congress. And he's been backed now by increasingly desperate statements from Zelensky. Now, Zelensky has come out and said straightforwardly, if Congress won't release further aid to Ukraine, then Ukraine will lose the war. Um, this, well, it is true that if Congress doesn't provide further aid to Ukraine, authorize further aid to Ukraine, if Donald Trump is elected president in November, and once he becomes president, in that case in January, cuts off further aid to Ukraine, then it is indeed the case that Ukraine will have lost the war. But, as Matthew Blackburn essentially pointed out yesterday in that article in National Interest, which I discussed in my previous video, and as those Ukrainian officers who were interviewed by Politico a couple of days ago also pointed out, this is all really smoke and mirrors, because even if the United States does release further aid, if Congress does release further aid to Ukraine, if the $61 billion appropriation is provided to Ukraine in full, that still won't turn the situation around, and Ukraine will still be defeated. I'm not sure whether Trump knows that, or Speaker Johnson knows that, some people in Congress do understand it. Senator J.D. Vance, who comes across to me as an extremely clever man and one of the most grounded members of Congress, he definitely understands it. He's been making that point several times in several places. I am sure Senator Paul, Rand Paul, understands the point also. Anyway... <laughs> Suffice to say, the United States can provide another $61 billion to Ukraine, but it cannot change the military situation on the ground. It might provide Ukraine with rather more in the terms of ammunition, for example, artillery ammunition, probably mostly next year. But air defense missiles the United States cannot provide. Um, Zelensky's demand for 25 brigades <laughs> of Patriot missile systems, 150 to 200 launchers altogether, is, well, a third more than the United States has of these missiles itself. It's a fantastic demand, and it demonstrates the impossibility of the United States meeting these sort of needs. And, of course, there's lots of people who talk about military intervention and about a great air campaign by NATO against uh, Russia, attempts to impose some kind of no-fly zone. Now, I'm getting all kinds of reports about this from various people, one in particular, who remains convinced that NATO has an overwhelming preponderance against the Russians and that if an air campaign of the kind that he talks about was launched against the Russians, the Russians would be quickly defeated. And he seems to place huge faith in the ability of American stealth fighter jets to defeat the Russian Air Force. I have looked into this, and I have also, by the way, had more discussions with a variety of people about this matter. I have to say that the overwhelming con consensus from people who are, I think, very well informed about this issue, um, certainly people who could be called experts, of which, by the way, I am not one, is that far from this being an easy operation, it would be 
an exceptionally difficult one. The NATO air forces would probably suffer extremely high losses. Um, there might be significant damage done to America's and NATO's stealth fighter fleet. In fact, there's some uncertainty as to how exactly they would cope against the Russian air defense and fighter systems, which have become increasingly sophisticated and which have been tracking successfully both F-35 and F-22 fighter jets in the Middle East. And I've been provided with data about that. Uh, and um, anyway, one way or the other, this would be a massively high-risk enterprise with a very strong probability of it all ending in nuclear war. So I don't think that the United States wants to go there. I think that Donald Trump and the Republicans are more likely to be put off the idea of supplying aid to Ukraine by Foreign Minister Cameron's admonitions. I think the British, particularly British Conservatives, are completely oblivious to the feelings of some Americans, including some Americans within the Republican Party about Britain. And of course, Donald Trump, who remembers people like Christopher Steele and the role that he had in the problems that Donald Trump experienced during his previous presidency, might have even more reasons not to be particularly favorable towards the British and towards the current British government, just saying. Anyway, I suspect that David Cameron's calls are likely not to be particularly well received amongst Republicans and might in fact turn out to be counterproductive. They're probably not going to be particularly well received amongst Democrats either, by the way. I do wonder how the Biden administration feels about the British foreign minister traveling to Mar-a-Lago to, to meet with Donald Trump, accepting perhaps implicitly the extent of Donald Trump's power and political influence in the United States and perhaps treating him as the likely president to be. Just saying. Anyway, I would also say that the very latest in the enormously complicated twists and turns that we're getting from the congressional battle to try to get this aid package approved. The very latest news suggests that perhaps under pressure from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Speaker Johnson is again hardening his position. He's apparently floated proposals for the Democrats to make concessions on various other issues in return for his agreement for an aid package, a Ukraine aid package, to be put to the House. The Democrats are unwilling to make those concessions. Perhaps they're not able to make those concessions. And for the moment, at least, it's starting to look unlikely again that the package will be put to a vote in the House by Johnson, at least, um, at any point point over the next few weeks. I'm going to be very careful in making predictions about this. I've said many times, I don't really understand the Byzantine politics in Congress, and I'm not going to make any assumptions about the future of that aid package at all. But the main weight of the United States over the last couple of days, it's clear to me has been on trying to get China to cut off aid to Russia. Well, we have had a stinging commentary about all of this um, now from Global Times. And 
Global Times. Uh, they published a long article um, on the pressure from the United States to try to get China to reduce its economic trade flows with Russia. And anyway, the title <laughs> speaks for itself. It's written by the editorial board of Global Times. So this is an article by Global Times, as we're told. It's important to remember Global Times, told by the People's Daily, the official newspaper of China's Communist Party. Undoubtedly, in what it says, it reflects Chinese policy. Anyway, we are told China-Russia trade can withstand escalating pressure from the West. And um, it speaks about how Lavrov, Sergei Lavrov, is now in Beijing, and um, that there is increasing Western pressure on China to um, reduce trade with Russia. Uh, but Global Times says that China is absolutely not going to be in any way influenced in its economic relations with Russia by this pressure. And it says Chinese Foreign Minister spokesman Mao Ning said in a press conference in February that normal trade and economic cooperation between China and Russia is not targeted at any third party or subject to any interference by any third party. China remains steadfast in its position on this matter. Like many other developing countries and emerging economies, China is committed to pursuing its own interests whilst also adhering to international norms in economic and trade cooperation. Despite external pressures, China's willingness to continue economic and trade cooperation with Russia will not change. So there we are. Now, um, I think Western commentary now needs to try to get its narrative about China straightened out. There's been a cascade of articles, one after the other, for about two years now, about how supposedly China's economy is in crisis. And there's been this massive collapse in the real estate market, how the Chinese banking system is supposedly in crisis, how a country um, with 5% plus growth is supposedly on its back. I discussed recently a fine article which effectively debunks lots of these claims by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, though I should make it clear that article was not principally intended to debunk these myths. Rather, it looked at American economic policy towards China and its attempt basically to restrict Chinese economic development and about likely Chinese responses to this. But anyway, I think that this narrative that we've had, which according to Professor Sachs, actually derives from a CIA campaign authorized by no less a person than President Trump himself when he was president, just saying. Anyway, this narrative of Chinese economic stagnation or Chinese economic decline makes absolutely no sense with what other US officials are now saying, that Chinese manufacturing industry is now so strong, so powerful, it's become so modern. I've seen some pictures, by the way, some graphs which show the number of robots <laughs> that in any one year uh, China um, brings into service in its manufacturing industries. I noticed, by the way, that all of these graphs omit Russia. They don't talk about Russian robot developments, which I believe are extensive. And I think it's the World Bank has now produced another um, graph giving rankings of economies, which suggests that Russia is about to overtake J Japan and become the world's fourth biggest economy. 
and that Indonesia has also already overtaken Germany, just saying. But anyway, going back to China, um, suddenly we're getting all this narrative that the Chinese industry's manufacturing is too strong, too powerful, too advanced, that it's lopsidedly strong, that you know, China's ability to export advanced goods and materials and products threatens to swamp Western manufacturing, be it in cars and other industries, and um, that it therefore poses a massive threat to the United States and to the West. Well, that doesn't sound like a economy in crisis to me. I mean, I think people need to decide, is China actually in crisis? Or, on the contrary, is its economy, particularly its manufacturing economy, too strong to be resisted by the collective West? I think what has confused people is that China clearly has taken steps to re reduce the footprint of its real estate and financial industries in the economy. It's always had a structural bias to promote manufacturing. And um, that has perhaps become more acute, but that has led to some scrambling of the GDP figures, which are never a good, um, a good representation of economic perspectives. Overall, <laughs> Chinese manufacturing appears to be in a process of further growth. There is lots of mumbling about overcapacity, that China risks some kind of overproduction crisis, except, of course, that there is still huge markets around the world for Chinese goods. So that doesn't seem to be true. Anyway, one way or the other, the reality is coming back to what I said in my program, that the Chinese, or so it seems to me, are feeling at the moment very confident. They're writing articles increasingly in which they say that the United States is bogged down, trapped in the conflicts in the Middle East, but especially in Ukraine. They comment about the explosive growth in debt levels in the United States and compare that situation with their own, they feel that their manufacturing position is getting stronger. They feel that they have seen off America's technological challenges. There's lots of reports now about problems in getting chip manufacturing going in the United States. Uh, very different from what's happening in China. And by the way, I recently saw, read, um, a um, discussion of Russian plans to upgrade chip manufacturing in Russia. Very typical, careful Russian planning. I noticed, by the way, that the lead agency there is Rosatom, the nuclear engineering behemoth within the Russian economy, not Rostec, which I found interesting, and I, however, can think of reasons why that might be so. But anyway, the point is, the Chinese not only are not going to let themselves be pressured by the United States, they see no reason why they would be. And in fact, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov is now in China, and there's a long commentary by Yang Sheng in Global Times. Russian Foreign Minister's visit further strengthens Russian, China's, Russia's strategic partnership. And I think this is true. Prime Minister Bodhi, overwhelmingly likely to be re-elected in India. He is an avowed friend of President Putin's. Indian policy 
most unlikely to change. I think, going back to that National Interest article by Matthew Blackburn, a debacle is now taking shape in Ukraine. Desperate projects like intervention, military intervention by European powers in Ukraine, desperate project, projects like trying to get the Chinese or indeed the Indians to change their economic policies towards Russia, desperate demands by US officials like Jeff, Jeffrey Pyatt, State Department official, once upon a time, Victoria Newland's partner in crime, if I can put it like that, in engineering regime change in Ukraine. He's now demanding that the United States take steps to restrict Russian exports of liquefied natural gas. This perhaps linked to an article in um, um, oilnews.com, which says that Europe has now become the biggest importer of Russian liquefied natural gas. Anyway, all of these desperate moves, all of these desperate attempts to try to reverse an irreversible situation are only going to make the situation worse and potentially much worse. As Matthew Blackburn said, time to be realistic. Talk to Moscow. Find out what the Russians are thinking and what they want and see whether it might still be possible somehow to meet them halfway despite all of the massive mistrust that now exists. This administration can't do it. The German government won't do it. And the Russians very angry with Germany now, unlikely to speak to the Germans again. Perhaps a future administration may be the one that Donald Trump might lead in a year's time. They might be able to achieve something. One wonders what the state of Ukraine will actually be once that point has been reached. Anyway, that's the end of my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again. You can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop where you can buy all sorts of amazing things, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.